So thanks very much, Ken and Patrick, for the overview on EPI. Uh, now we turn to the anti-counterfeiting use case, which, which builds on electronic product information. My name is Daniel Fritz. I'm uh, the technology architect for supply chain at Novartis. I'm, I'm the industry lead also for the Pharma Ledger project. And um, I'm co-leading the use case with Alberto. Alberto? Thank you, Dan. So my name is Alberto Lopez, and I'm uh, innovation manager at the INCM. So that's the Portuguese Mint and National Printing Office. So before we delve fully into the anti-counterfeiting use case, it is good that we set the scene. Illicit trade in counterfeit and pirated goods is a significant and growing problem. Globalization has opened up new opportunities for criminal networks that expand the scope of the illicit trade in counterfeit goods. In 2016, international trade in counterfeit pharmaceuticals reached over $4 billion. While this poses a threat to public health and safety, it enriches criminals and organized crime. Counterfeit medicines affect society in many different ways. So for example, patients who fall victim to low quality counterfeit products that may not treat their medical needs may end up losing their confidence in healthcare professionals and health systems, if not their lives. Also, as bad quality counterfeit medicines are often not properly formulated and may contain dangerous uh, ingredients, they pose a threat to public health. And if we look at the economic impact, Counterfeit medicines may also result in higher healthcare costs as patients may require additional treatment to deal with potential adverse effects of ineffective or damaging drugs. And finally, governments may be forced to dedicate resources to develop and implement regulatory and enforcement measures against this kind of crime. Criminals have also found a way to benefit from the increasing trends in e-commerce and the purchase of pharmaceutical products online. The WHO, has estimated that over half of the medicines purchased over the internet from illegal sites are actually counterfeit. However, the vast majority of consumers are unlikely to be able to detect counterfeit products on their own. This use case intends to build on existing regulatory requirements and the use of blockchain to tackle this defenselessness. Thanks, Alberto. The, the situation, I think, becomes a little bit more relevant with the current COVID crisis. Um, we've already seen mm, examples of counterfeit um, tests or counterfeit or sub sub quality personal protective equipment. Next year, there's going to be millions and millions, hundreds of millions, if not billions of doses of vaccine um, in distribution around the world. And it is going to be a great challenge or it's a, it is a, going to be a, a a chat, an opportunity for for counterfeiters to take advantage of that those volumes and the strong desire in the population to get to get vaccinated. So, so it is a it is a very relevant issue. Now, what are we actually proposing? The this um, information flow or or process flow basically um, depicts what we are working on and, and currently specifying. The, the top line, starting with a patient, is, is, is the EPI, or the electronic product information, which is already what Ken and Patrick just presented to you in, in the last um, presentation. It is its EPI, and, that's, and it starts with that. Now, what we do with anti-counterfeiting is we build on that. We can take the information that's embedded in that data matrix or in a barcode, and we can use that information to perform some additional checks. The first one is uh, whether or not it's actually been produced. I mean, does it have an e-leaflet associated with it? Second is, does it have a valid serial number? Third, is the product stack is correct? Or has it been released to the market? Or has it been reported stolen? Or should it have been destroyed a few months ago? The fourth check is whether or not there's an, uh, a feature uh, embedded in the packaging, which can be checked either visually or remotely using a smartphone. And Alberto is going to talk a little bit more about what those features are. We, we all have them, um, usually in our wallets. And finally, uh, a general check on, on suspect products, if there's any kind of business rules or things um, for terms of a location or something that happened, um, that would be the final one. 
um, if the product has an authentication feature, then the patient can opt to check that in addition. Um, as mentioned, either visually looking at it, um, whether there's a tamper evidence seal or using a smartphone camera to take a picture of a feature um, that can be then um, checked using a backend system and then return the results um, to the patient. This all gives um, or should result in a higher degree of confidence in the authenticity of the product, which is ideally increasing the trust um, of the patient in, in the product and, and in the quality. Um, the last point here, and we're going to get into a little bit more detail there, is around um, what we're calling a anti-counterfeit data collaboration, or ACDC, where we use the data from the industry checks and from these transactions from across all different medicines and all different geographies to get bigger insights and bigger um, um, uh, or to enable real-time reporting and alerts to see where the, the counterfeit problems are, or how they could be um, combated in a, in a more effective manner rather than just on an individual level. So this is, is using the consolidation or a big data approach, basically. But we'll talk about that more later. Um, so I'll turn it back over to Alberto for uh, another view. Thank you, Dan. This diagram uh, depicts all key components of the anti-counterfeiting use case, in just a different manner compared to what Dan just uh, showed. So in the very first column, we have the different intended users of the solution that we will create starting from the medicine user, hospitals and healthcare practitioners, pharmacies or dispensaries, distributors, law enforcement, and then manufacturers. This solution aims at filling the gaps of current processes, as well as contributing further, enhancing functionalities that, to support the different users. The use case will be developed to be supported in two different kinds of devices. On the one hand, via an app that will be installed in mobile devices, and that will have the ability not to only display the product information, but also to enable the user to perform the authentication of different pieces of information. And then on the other hand, a web app that will enable institutional users to better manage the data that is fed in the process. Regarding data input, in a first phase, information coming from the individual medicine boxes will be supported, but we have the ambition to extend those fun functionalities to batch verifications, which may be a better suit for hospitals or distributors. By scanning the 2D data matrix code, checks will be performed as displayed in the multi-factor product authentication column. Two of those checks come from two of the other use cases you just heard about. Those will be the product status and EPI or e-leaflet check. Three of these additional checks are a serial number check, an ACDC check, of which you will hear about in a moment, and then also an authentication feature check. With regards to this last check, it is planned for the app to support a variety of authentication features, always under the premise that they can be collected by the user by means of uh, the mobile phones, camera, or other sensors. The last two columns refer to the ACDC, a data collaboration tool that would allow regulatory authorities, the industry, and law enforcement to have a, a deep insight on the data gener generated by all users. Thanks, Alberto. I think the um, the the core of our multi-factor authentication, multi-factor product authentication uh, capability is um, the check of an authenticator. And just to make sure that everybody understands what we're talking about when we talk about authentication features. Um, I'll let Alberto explain this because he's an expert from the, the Portuguese Mint in, in any counterfeit efforts. Thanks, Dan. So by authentication, we mean asking the question, is this product genuine or false? And actually, we all carry around items that are equipped with uh, authentication or, or security features. So for example, to, the, to everyone listening, just go to your wallet and get a 20 euro bank, uh, banknote. That note is embedded with a variety of security features that prevent their counterfeiting. 
So if you take that note and you pass your fingers along the shorter edges, you will be able to feel a series of lines that are raised. If you look at the banknote against the light, you will see a portrait watermark as well as a security thread across the note. If you tilt the banknote, you will see a hologram stripe that shows a portrait and also the value of the banknote. All of these features are considered overt features and they are easily perceived by human senses. There are other kinds of features known as covert that provide an additional layer of security to items and products. But those typically require special devices to be validated. So for example, if we go back to your 20 euro banknote, you can find microprint in some of the areas around the Gothic window or small fibers that are embedded in the paper that can only be identified when the note is exposed to UV light. On this slide, you can also see another example of an authentication feature called Unicode that is produced by the Portuguese Mint and that is currently used in Portuguese tax stamps and by some Portuguese wine producers. The Unicode is not simply a 2D code, but rather a combination of several security elements, as you can see in, in the image. Uh, the presence of different elements can be used to encode a message that contains information that can be used to match or validate another feature. The combination of these elements allows us to provide a unique identifier that is configurable and adaptable to any product, be it a document, a stamp, or a card. We are planning for the PharmaLayer app to be able to identify and validate a variety of authentication features that are currently embedded in different medicine packages as well as allow others to be seamlessly introduced. So this way, we hope to be able to give patients the ability to validate authentication features on medicine packages with just a few taps on their smart smartphones. Thanks, Alberto. I think it's an, it's an important uh, point to mention that we're, we're looking at this from a feature agnostic perspective. We, we understand that there's a, a lot of different ways um, that products are protected. Um, in the market, and we're not saying we have to use one of the other features. The use of a common app um, to, to, to check the features using a, a different backend system will enable um, the industry also to, to keep their, their current processes and packaging processes without, without changing them. Um, this is, I, when you mentioned the, the 20 euro bill, Maybe you've seen at many um, uh, cash, cashiers that they have a little tool that checks a 50 euro note or a 100 euro note. Basically, what we're saying is let's give that power to check the authenticity to, to every pa patient with, the, with their smartphone. Now, uh, multi-faulty, multi-factor product authentication is one part of it. The other part of it is the ACDC or anti-counterfeit data collaboration here. We just present this how, how uh, kind of a conceptual, high-level conceptual approach where you see that manufacturers are feeding additional information there. They may have specific business rules. The um, confidentiality of the data uh, is preserved and protected between different manufacturers. So it's not um, um, that... Um, we can uh, infer volumes or something of the competition. This is uh, not supposed to be a competitive tool. Um, and it's also feeding in all of the transactional data from all of the different um, uh, checks that are performed with the MFPA. Um, we, we see that this is um, uh, going to provide a lot of value by, by consolidating this information. And then ultimately, um, we can extend the access to this or the insights uh, uh, into this data into law enforcement who may be able to take action with it. So um, that, that's the use case. And, and we see that blockchain brings some benefits there as a, just along as with EPI uh, as well as a trusted source of truth. It's, prevent, it's um, protecting the privacy of the, the users. And, um, and, not, and not capturing any of the personal information or what, what medicines they may be taking. It's a common approach in the industry and everybody using the common approach creates value. And then there's no end to additional um, use cases that we could, we could build on top of it. This is maybe a good time to ask a question. I mean, if you knew that um, 
that a product was um, uh, 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 able to be verified or authenticated using your smartphone, um, even if you're in a in a high income country with not a huge counterfeit issue, would you would you use the app to check the medicine authenticity? That is uh, something we can we can ask on Slido and then see the results. Our last slide uh, puts it all together. Basically, we're leveraging blockchain, emerging top technologies to give the patients a powerful tool, um, patient empowerment, and basically um, consolidating this data to get some insights to fight this issue on a global scale. Um, it is, uh, as Pharma Ledger is a Europe project, uh, you know, we're focused on, on Europe, but we see that this could become or could be of value or a version of it could be of value also in other areas, lower medium income countries that um, have a real problem um, with counterfeit medicines, as Alberto mentioned in the, in the first slide. So with that, uh, we'd like to thank you very much for your attention. And we will now, I believe, move over to some live Q&A. Thank you very much, Daniel. Um, so um, the first question, uh, which was uh, most popularly voted, is what's the status of the projects? When do they go live? And is this only for the EU market or uh, is it global? Um, <laughs> okay. The, uh, I mean, last part of that question, um, from the industry perspective, uh, definitely um, all of the uh, companies, the beneficiaries, members of the consortium are global players, the, um, their, their marketing products around the world. And as, as Jan presented in his presentation, these supply chains are quite complex and extend over multiple geographies. So the, the intention is that while these um, solutions um, are, are designed within the EU market, that they could potentially be scaled um, to other markets in the future. And of course, that's, that's really important for, for a blockchain solution because the real value comes from uh, scaling it to, uh, uh, you know, to a network. Um, and the more participants that um, are, are engaged in it, the, the more value that's created. In terms of the status, I mean, just to, to um, emphasize, Pharma Ledger is an innovation and research um, project and it is, um, it's, its stated intention is to do a reference implementation in a pre-productive environment. Um, that said, as, as Ken and Patrick mentioned with EPI, we've, we've also chosen to accelerate some of these projects uh, and to create a productive version um, well before the end of the project. So we are, we're hoping that we can meet and exceed the, the stated objectives of Pharma Ledger by creating solutions that can already create value um, as soon as possible. And, and so that's our, that's our intention. Um, and I think basically we, we intend to keep you updated on, on the status of this as we go, go forward through the regular newsletters um, or our, our pharmaledger.eu website. So I would, if you're not signed up for the newsletters, I, I think that's a great uh, way to, to stay abreast on what the current status uh, of the projects are. It's very dynamic. A lot of things are changing, of course, and, and that's where you can get the latest information. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Okay, our next question is, uh, is quite a, a wide one. Um, what is the greatest benefit of blockchain to a regulatory agency? Um, I'm not sure who wants to pick this one up. And I guess the same question to uh, Daniel and Alberto in terms of anti-counterfeiting. Um, I mean, I, I think that the, the problems of anti-counterfeiting, you know, not only to patients, but they also are impacting the efficiency and the costs of health systems um, as, as well, and, and, and also reducing the trust from, from health systems. Um, if, if there's a way we can create a more trust in the information and in the authenticity of the different medicines, um, I think that's going to, to remove huge amount of waste and, and fraud 
from the overall system. So that is a, a key incentive um, from that perspective. Super. Okay, thank you. Um, I guess this uh, is a question for uh, Alberto. Um, but can counterfeiter, counterfeiters also counterfeit the 3D matrix code, which would negate the effectiveness of using a mobile app? I can take that if you wish. Sure. sure. I, I think it's a 2D matrix code, but uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, of course you can you can uh, copy the data matrix code, but in the data matrix codes for the EU, we have serialization, and there's a serial number in there. So you would have to know the serial numbers as well um, in order for it to be of any real use, essentially, to you. But, but technically, absolutely. But but serialization does is one component of the whole anti-counterfeiting suite of measures that are on these packs. So it's not the one and only thing. Just to, to add it that, yes, a counterfeiter can copy a data matrix. Um, but that's, that's um, we can also then um, uh, use additional checks in the multi-factor product authentication to um, in, increase the confidence and the authenticity of that um, using the authentication feature, using the, the traceability status, using um, also other business rules. So, so the, the idea is the combination of all these checks is going to increase the, um, the, the likelihood. And if there is um, all of a sudden 10 different um, uh, the same serial notes sh showing up in different places, that, that could be an alert or a notification that uh, would, would uh, lead to identifying that as a suspect product. Okay, super. Okay. Um... I think we've got some questions there that we've already uh, taken. Um, so there's one actually I'd like to ask uh, Dan, which I, I know has been um, asked. Uh, let me just see if I can find it. Uh, yeah, um, what are the coming milestones to achieve the di distributed ledger? Each pharma company has to has first to implement blockchain use before. Uh, and this may take time. So Dan, can you talk about the, the milestones for Pharma Ledger, please? Uh, that's a great question. That's a great question. Um, I think, you know, it's true. Each company will have to come to the decision, the conclusion to adopt a solution. Um, the prerequisite for that is, is the awareness of the solution, is a trust in the maturity of the solution, and um, uh, being convinced that this is going to create value. Um, we, we, we can do webinars, we can do um, uh, a lot of slides and everything to talk about what blockchain has uh, is in promise, but we've seen that over the past years. Um, I think what, one of the main focuses of this project is, is to realize the reference implementations of these use cases uh, in a, in a pre-productive environment in order to prove the value of those solutions. Um, and so, so if we can get the value proved, if we can get the, um, uh, get the industry and the ecosystem convinced that this brings value um, and then prove it through um, uh, ultimately then an adoption of a critical mass or a, a minimum viable ecosystem, then I think we could start this journey in, uh, in a serious manner. Um, so that's, that's basically the, um, the, the milestones that I see. These milestones, there's, there's other things that, that are included, such as the dissemination, the communication, the governance that are all included in, in, as part of this effort. It's not just about a technical solution at all. Um, I, I just take this opportunity also to mention that the pharmaledger.eu uh, website has got additional information and also has a possibility to sign up for a newsletter so that you can kind of see how the uh, progress um, proceeds, see the, the press releases as they're, as they're posted and get the latest um, information um, as, as we move on. Um, the, just to add, I mean, we, we know that um, Pharma Ledger is an innovation and research project. 
but we're also quite optimistic and, and um, that we can maybe go beyond just innovation and research with, with a productive pilot or with a productive solution um, um, during the course of the, the project, which would be a great accomplishment. Right, okay, thank you. Um, the next question I think uh, was asked during the anti-counterfeiting presentation. Uh, what if a patient doesn't have a mobile or a smartphone? Um, so Dan or Alberto, can you um, provide an answer for this one? Yeah, I'll, I'll take it. Uh, so the, um, we are with the EPI also planning to enable this um, via a, um, a PC um, capability. So, so you don't have to be stuck with um, iOS or, or Android or something. To, to be able to do this. This is, of course, of an, an electronic piece. This multi-factor product authentication is an electronic check. Um, so it, uh, it, it does need, at this, at this time currently, to have a, uh, a, an internet connection uh, and everything. Um, I think also when it comes to, to EPI, if, if somebody doesn't have a phone, doesn't have a PC, um, or something like that, we would um, have to ensure that pharmacies and um, are, are also uh, have the capability to print a, a paper version of the electronic product information or that the pharmacy is also able to perform um, some of the um, authentication checks. The, this is already the case today in when, when medicines are dispensed from the pharmacy um, according to the falsified medicines directive that they use, um, that they check the serial number. So, um, and we can consider adding, adding some of those checks there too at that point of dispense. Okay, no problem, thank you. Um, our next question um, is, aren't all wholesalers and pharmacy associations missing in the consortium? They probably have a different view on the benefits of farm ledger as you presented. Um, uh, Dan, do you want to pick that up? Because that's sort of a, um, sort of a high level uh, issue there. Yeah, we, we've got uh, 29 entities in the consortium, including 12 pharmaceutical companies and 17 public partners. Um, and, and clearly, if we wanted to have um, everybody that would be impacted ultimately by the by such a transformation, um, we would probably have an unmanageable crew. Um, what we what we decided um, our strategy in the project was basically to you know start the project without the clear use cases defined or prioritized, but rather um, to choose the domains that we would use. Supply chain being one of them, clinical trials and health data being the other ones. And then based on those use cases, then to engage with the stakeholders. And, and so this is, this is actually what we're, this is the stage we're in right now in the project is going through the initial requirements and then do, doing a stakeholder analysis, determining what the different interests or incentives are of the different stakeholders, determining what measures and KPIs um, would impact them. And so, and the, the, really the next step is then to be reaching out to the stakeholders and, and bringing them in as partners for the project. So we can, we, there's no reason, you know, that the, the project um, uh, can't partner with such wholesalers, distributors, pharmacy associations. And, and we, we've been already in contact prior to the project, during the project uh, in that regard. So I would expect more, more engagement in, in, for, the, for that based on the specific use cases going forward. Super, thank you very much. Um, uh, we'll give you two a rest now because I think this next question is for Dan and Alberto uh, regarding anti counterfeiting use case. Uh, have you planned an integration with the EU hub and or other out of EU markets national databases? Um, for those that don't know, the, the EU hub is um, referring to the EMVS, the European Medicines Verification System which is under the EMVO, the European Medicines Verification Organization. The, the short answer is yes, we have engaged with EMVO um, on, on several occasions and actually have another meeting in, in a week after next on this. 
Um, we are we want to leverage existing solutions and standards wherever possible with this project. We don't want to reinvent the wheel, um, for sure. Um, that said, we also are looking at, so if there's not, uh, we, we don't want to exclude um, countries or markets that don't have a national systems. So there should be a solution that enables this also um, without a central, uh, a central hub. Super, thank you. Uh, I'm very conscious of the time, so I'm, I'm going to just um, tackle one last question. Um, any questions that uh, haven't that aren't going to be answered here live, we will uh, endeavour to uh, answer them um, via a blog post uh, on our website uh, and through our newsletters as well. So we'll, we'll try to make sure that there's answers for, for all of your questions. So the last question, uh, it's, it's sort of a, quite a wide one. Uh, who's the owner of the blockchain uh, in the Pharma Ledger project? The uh, Pharma Ledger project, Dan here, just to answer that, is the um, has a governance work package, which is currently evaluating different governance models. We know that some entity or some consortium has to um, support and operate, or you know, the 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 solution or the platform beyond the life of the project. So that that's part of the project that's in it, and and the and um, and the uh, evaluation of the governance models is currently ongoing. The recommendation for that will happen in the near future. Okay, super. Thank you. Okay, I think we've uh, we've taken uh, all the questions we can in the time that we have available. Like I say, we'll we'll try and uh, endeavour to answer the others via the website and blog posts. Um, so it remains for me to say thank you to all of our speakers uh, for their excellent presentations today. Uh, I'd also like to thank everyone uh, involved in the production of the webinar today. And uh, I'd especially like to thank you, the audience, for your um, attendance and your participation today. Um, um, the recording of this event will be available uh, via the um, Pharma Ledger website um, very soon after. And as um, uh, Dan encouraged you earlier, if you're not already signed up to the newsletters, then we'd encourage you to do that and you can visit the Farm Ledger website to find the link to do that. Um, our next webinar is planned to be in February, early February of next year. And we look forward to seeing you all then. But uh, for now, thank you for your participation. Have a great day. Mm -hmm.